Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this special opportunity to engage with the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of State. Today, we'll also be hearing from three inspiring and accomplished young leaders who are focused on environmental concerns in Southeast Asia. These three presenters are members of the U.S. government's Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, which is a U.S. government program. And let me quickly say, if you are between the ages of 18 to 35 and you are not yet a member of YSEALI, you should be. So we'll add some description to the video below so that you can become a part of our family. I'm Jason Seymour. I'm the spokesperson for the mission to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, also known as ASEAN. I want you to know that the United States is deeply, deeply committed to working with our partners to ensure that everyone living on this planet has access to a clean, healthy environment. We must respond together to the climate crisis. As the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, recently said, no country can overcome this existential threat alone. We are in this together. And what each of our nations does or does not do will not only impact the people of our country, but people everywhere. Today, I have the distinct honor of introducing you to someone who shares this commitment. Throughout her life, Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman has dedicated herself to a wide range of causes that impact health, security, peace, and advancing academic opportunities. She cares deeply about people as demonstrated by her completion of a master's degree in social work. She cares deeply about developing young leaders, as reflected from her time as the director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. And she cares deeply about peace and security, which was revealed in her numerous roles in the diplomatic corps under President Clinton and President Obama, and now under President Biden. And one aspect of our leadership that our Deputy Secretary fully understands and appreciates is that significant change only comes when we listen to each other and we learn from each other. And she is very eager to listen today to our Waisili participants, but first we want to take a moment to listen to our Deputy Secretary, Wendy Sherman. Got it. Okay, so you can see one difference already between my generation and yours. I'm sitting here with pieces of paper, and my young colleague here is sitting here with her telephone. So um, I should have put my remarks on my cell phone, right? That's what you did? Yes? So uh, it would have been a lot easier than sitting here with pieces of paper. So forgive me, uh, I'm learning. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. Nothing is more energizing than being with the future leaders of each of our countries, wherever I am in the world. Wherever I go, I'm committed to meeting with people younger than myself, which is pretty much everybody these days. But particularly glad to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, I'm honored to be the first woman Deputy Secretary of State, which is sort of crazy that it took until 2021 to make that happen. Uh, but my first trip as Deputy Secretary of State is here to Southeast Asia and to Indonesia in the first instance. If you didn't know, the 10 ASEAN countries combined represent 650 million people, the third largest population in the world. 60% of you are under the age of 35. So it is your generation and your corner of the world that will increasingly play a pivotal role 
in shaping the global course for generations to come. As was mentioned, during the last two and a half years, I taught at Harvard's Kennedy School. Might have even taught some of you who are listening in, since I had students from all over the world. I had the privilege to interact and learn from young people across the globe. I learned that many of you are motivated, enterprising, highly networked, and care deeply about the global challenges we face especially climate change and environmental degradation. Globally, at the Kennedy School, it is the number one issue on the minds of students. So on my first trip abroad, I wanted to have an opportunity from, to hear from all of you, the next generation of leaders who are working to combat climate change and protect the environment. As leaders in the region, and members of YSEALI, you play an outsider's role in working across borders to tackle the climate crisis. I applaud the ideas that many of you have implemented to lead climate action in your countries and communities. What I've learned from my students is they are not waiting for us to ask them to do something or to tell them to do something. They've already taken it into their own hands. You've taken it into your own hands to build the NGOs, to build the projects, to be advocates, to press your governments to do better. The next decade will be a critical period to implement actions to enable net zero emissions globally by 2050 and keep a 1.5 degree temperature increase limit within reach. I know many of you already know this, and I'm proud to tell you that the leadership of the United States is listening to what many of you have been saying we cannot delay action on climate any longer. President Biden, Vice President Harris, Secretary Blinken, upon taking office on January 20th, President Biden took immediate actions to follow through on his pledge to make combating climate change a top priority. On his first day in office, President Biden returned the United States to the Paris Agreement. Also on his first day, President Biden issued an executive order declaring climate as an essential element of foreign policy. President Biden then named my friend and former boss, Secretary John Kerry, to be the special presidential envoy on climate. On April 22nd, Earth Day, the president convened 40 fellow heads of state at the Leaders' Summit on Climate including the leaders of Indonesia, China, Russia, and many more. Further, the United States has now pledged to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 50, 52% by 2030 and achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And as part of this goal, the United States intends to double its public climate finance to developing countries by 2024. And the president did all of this within the first 100 days in office. To be sure, there's an enormous amount yet to be done. But we are off to a bold start and focused on building international momentum toward this year's COP26 in Glasgow, where we expect countries across the globe to further increase their climate ambition and climate results. Lastly, I would like to reaffirm that the United States will be a partner with you, your countries, and with ASEAN to increase the ambition to fight climate change, limit global temperature rise, and secure the future for you and the generations that come behind you. I am old enough to be both a mother and a grandmother, and I want to make sure that my two little grandsons, five and seven, get to grow up in this world, that they have a planet in which they can function and lead and grow. So I thank you for being the leaders that can ensure that will happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Secretary, for those inspirational words. And now we're gonna hear from three inspirational speakers, members of our Waisili family. We're going to start with an alumnus a program alumnus from a, uh, a Filipino named Kier Patogo. 
and he is going to talk to us about biodiversity. We hear so much about how the climate crisis will have a dramatic impact on our animal species. And we have a terrible, exciting story for you today about a discovery of an animal that was thought to be extinct. So Kier, please, please join us. Welcome to the program. Hello, thank you, thank you so much. Um, let me share a screen first. I have a presentation prepared for, uh, for this. Oops, I hope you can see now. Um, so once again, good afternoon, everyone. Mayong um, hapon kaninyong tanan. Good afternoon, Madam and Mabuhay from the Philippines. Once again, I am here and I'm a wildlife biologist working at the Protected Area Office here in Southern Mindanao in the Philippines. That's in Southern Philippines. Uh, so here in our region, I grew up um, surrounded with nature. I live by the bay and in the background are mountain ranges that, which gives us or provide us with clean water and air. Um, so I consider myself lucky growing up because I have access to nature. So I really wanted to contribute to the conservation of our environment. So when I had a chance to pursue my master's degree in 2017, I decided to work on the biodiversity of this huge mountain range in our region. It's a key biodiversity area and an important conservation priority site in the country. Unfortunately, that mountain range is, there's no legal framework for its protection yet. So it's not yet protected. So its biodiversity is very vulnerable to threats such as unsustainable agricultural practices and mining. So we, um, so that's the photos of, uh, from, from, the, from that mountain range that I took. Um, so as you can see, it's still pristine, and um, there's a lot of wildlife living in the area, of course. Um, so with the help of the USAID Protect Wildlife, I was able to generate the uh, much-needed biodiversity data to inform or um, for the conservation of, of that mountain range. So the USAID Protect Wildlife particularly funded my project on the amphibians and reptiles in Mount Busa. And as you can see on the screen, it's one of the knowledge products generated from that project. I've also helped improve and, uh, our understanding of that a mountain range by um, conducting studies on orchids and on birds, of course, in collaboration with other organizations, uh, because I know that these information are crucial and will help strengthen the conservation relevance of, of that mountain range. And one of the most important um, discovery of this whole conservation journey of mine was the Gutman stream frog. Um, I don't know if it's, you can see that in your screen now. Sorry. So this Gottman stream frog is an extremely rare species of frog, which was lost for 27 years. So the scientific community thought that it's actually gone extinct until our rediscovery in 2020, somewhere in the deep forested area in that mountain range. So that discovery actually sends a message of hope, not just only to us who's been working hard for the conservation of the mountain range, but also to the many people who are in this line of work in the field of wildlife conservation. And I'm so happy that the work that um, I do here in the Busa Mountain Range have gained a lot of public and media attention because it highlights the Busa Mountain Range. It highlights the understudied yet very rich biodiversity of, of Southern Mindanao here in the Philippines. And at present, we've been using the information gathered from my project to inform policies and conservation interventions for the protection and conservation of, Mount, of the Busa mountain range. In fact, I've helped draft the protected area suitability assessment reports of these two important watersheds in our region in which the Busa mountain range is situated. And I'm really happy to share that at present, uh, the process for establishing the Busa mountain range as a protected area is already already ongoing. So I really want to thank YCLE for, you know, for preparing me for this task because YCLE has really helped improve my leadership skills and it really inspired me to pursue this ambitious conservation journey. Indeed, it's never too early to start for me and I'm never too young to lead. Um, and also want to thank the USAID Protect Wildlife for, you know, supporting my biodiversity in Mount Pusa project. Because without it, I wouldn't have been able to generate the much needed 
biodiversity information for its conservation and protection. So I do hope that more leadership and financial support is given to young people, is given to early career researchers such as myself, for us to continue documenting the rich biodiversity, not just only here in the Philippines, but also in the whole Southeast Asian region as well, for the protection of our remaining forests, you know, because it, it, it helps mitigate you know, climate change and other, and it gives us important services. You know what, Matt? Then when I started this project, all I want is to improve the narrative that Southern Mindanao is not a place of conflict. We are a place of unique cultural and biological diversity that is needing attention. So I do hope that more young people are inspired by my story to take or to start their own conservation journey and make great discoveries in the field. So that's all for me. And thank you once again for the opportunity to share my work with you. Thanks so much, Kira. Please, Deputy Secretary, if you have a question. Here, uh, first of all, I'm not sure I'd ever let a lizard uh, crawl up the side of my head. <laughs> Really impressed with your courage and with your incredible research. The other thing, I mentioned my little grandsons. Their very, very favorite activity in the entire world is catching frogs. Uh, so uh, I hope that I can get a copy of your presentation. They will go completely wild that you found mm -hmm. a frog uh, that was almost extinct. They put them all back. They catch them and then they let them go. Uh, mm -hmm. But they like to catch frogs. Uh, and, you know, these are kids who live in an urban environment, not in the incredible scenic areas that you have tried to preserve and in encourage biodiversity. So what would you say to folks, young people, who live in urban environments about what they can do to encourage biodiversity and holding on to what we have? Mm -hmm. So my message for them is to really appreciate nature around us because biodiversity, it's everywhere, even in urban environment. What we need to do is just to reconnect ourselves with nature, ourselves with nature, like just by looking at your simple, like small critters in the backyard, uh, appreciating birds in the, you know, in, 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 in your garden, for example, you can really um, develop this sense of um, connection with nature. And that gives you uh, somehow a sense of responsibility for the conservation and protection of the environment. So I guess that's my message, just to strengthen this relationship with nature, because unfortunately, as we grow, as, you know, as the, the, the world gets um, uh, improved in terms of its technology, a lot of people have been alienated from nature. And I do hope that more young people will, you know, try to reestablish them, it's, its connection with nature. So. Thank you so much, Kier. It's really impressive mm -hmm. what you've done, and I wish you all the best in your future. Thank you so much, Madam. Thanks so much for your presentation, Kier. And it's nice to see you, and I know we'll see each other again. So let's move on to our next guest, who is in studio with us. Margareta Quina is an Indonesian environmental attorney who specializes in pollution, public health, and climate and energy cases. She has been involved with the Indonesian Toxic Free Network and the Indonesian Zero Waste Alliance. In addition, she was once a researcher at the Indonesian Center for Environmental Law, which is the oldest environmental law advocacy group in Indonesia. Quina, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, everyone, for joining this conversation. So as Jason mentioned, I am an environmental lawyer, and my role is to serve you all in using the mechanism that is available in the state to access environmental information, to participate in environmental decision making, and also when it's really necessary to go to the court to enforce the law, to use the right that is available to us to get the environmental justice. So I was really lucky because um, my education as a part of Fulbright program gave me the substantive knowledge necessary to gain this, all this rustic knowledge about old brown pollution issue. But it was really wisely Women Leadership Academy that gave me the soft skill in navigating these cases, the relationship that we have in environmental cases and take it beyond the court. It's really about connecting with the people who can take the cases and um, use the outcome of the case in making the changes. 
the people in the government, the people in the industry, the urban people and the consumers. So the case is only as good as its plaintiff, and it's only as impactful as the people who can use the outcome of the case to push for the changes and influencing the decisions within their own role. And environmental cases is, will not impacting if it stays within the court. It will only have the impact that, um, that could really make a change when the people in the movement use it within their own hands. And I'm going to dem demonstrate one of my favorite cases in here. It's an old water pollution case from about 2015. The people in this room might know Chitarum River. That is an old polluted river in Indonesia. And there's been many efforts to kind of like tackle the pollution. And in 2015, a group of environmental NGO decided to file a lawsuit against a permit. And my role in there uh, was really insignificant. So I just accepted a last minute um, request to review the filing. And I just pointed out to the lawyer, oh, there's this really highly technocratic instrument called pollution load that you can actually test in the court. And they used it. And the case made its way into the Supreme Court and winning. But what we didn't know was this tool, the pollution load, has been critical for the people inside MOEF to advocate for a change in the government priority to allocate more funding for more effective pollution control that is tailored to permit. So it is really because these people in the government side and also the people in the slow fashion movement who really care about changing their behavior in buying more slow fashion, more um, environmentally conscious brands that really make the case successful. Yes, the outcome was good, but it was really, really the decision um, that outside the court that makes it really significant. And this illustrates why everybody in here, including your question, Deputy Chairman, all of the people in the urban areas can play a critical role in environmental conservations in issues that is really invisible to us in the climate change, in the fight against coal, and so on. What I observe from the cases, environmental cases especially, is there's this really technical things that need scientists to take their part and produce, um, analyze this data, technical work. But as soon as it's available for the people, some advocates who can push for a more kind of like adversarial challenges can actually take it into their own hands to push for accountability and do the kind of like difficult political commitment work. So I was really impressed with the work that US government has been doing with ASEAN countries for Jakarta, for example, the technical analysis and the data availability, the transparency that you pushed has been really helpful in many cases, including in one of the fight on air quality that Jakarta Citizens is initiating. And we thank you, and we really hope to see more people being able to access the peer learning, the um, inspiration from the environmental movement across Southeast Asia, and also deciding about how they are going to play the role. Thank you so much. So, Margareta, um, you know, there is a huge population of young people across Southeast Asia. They all need jobs. A lot of people argue that you can't move too fast on saving the environment because there are a lot of jobs that are connected to the fossil fuel economy, to coal and to other and to fossil fuels in general. So what advice would you give to governments about how to balance between create, job creation and the environment, or do they work together? There are two things that has been really taking place, the conversation um, in, in the United States, actually. The first one is about the availability of green jobs as a result of re renewable deployment and kind of like more environmentally sustainable alternatives to fossil fuel. 
And the second one is the importance of just transition. And actually, it was also from my US colleagues that I learned about the fight to really ensure a just transition plan as a part of the climate deal and um, the transition from the fossil fuel. So I believe the two are mutually reinforcing. And as I mentioned earlier, it's definitely involving a lot of um, analysis from the social science, from the scientific perspective, and economic perspective as well. And I think um, we can only know as long as those information are widely available and allow this discussion within um, or between the citizens. If I can follow up this follow up for just one moment. Just, I think most people here might know, but just in case they don't, if you'd explain what a just transition means. So just transition basically recognized that, yes, there would be adverse impact from transition to fossil fuel, and that impact will likely um, felt more hard by, the, by some population. For example, the poor, the people who's working within the fossil fuel industry, and it's actually also the people who feel the most climate impact in, because of their economy or race or because of the other things. So um, Just Transition acknowledge that fact and take their voices into account and really make sure that these people, this vulnerable population who's been depending on fossil fuel get a just alternative, get a kind of like priority in the transition, or at least being taken into account. Thanks so much. My guess is you're going to be very much a part of the leadership around that just transition. Thank you very much. That's actually the people in here, I guess. I was just... Indeed. <laughs> at, the, at your surface. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aquina. Uh, this is the second. So this is the second time you've participated in a mission program, and your passion just excites me so much. So keep up the good work. So now let's move to our third presenter, who is from Burma, Nin Pyu Sin. Nin is uh, an environmental science and flood management specialist. Many, commu many communities, as we all know, could be deeply impacted if the sea levels rise because of climate change. And so flood risk is a very, very serious issue. Welcome to the program, Nin. Just a, just a moment, Nin. You might be on mute. Hey. Oh, sorry. There Hello, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm very honored to be here meeting with Mrs. Sherman and otherwise the alumni and the new participants. Let me share my screen first. Mm. Okay, I have everyone my seat my screen, uh, but uh, that does it just assuring uh, my uh, participation in the YC Lee program. So I have joined three YC Lee programs, YC Lee Summit, Academy Fellowship, and Regional Workshop. The Academy Fellowship was the last one that I participated. It was at the Esports Center, uh, Hawaii. Yeah, um, before I, uh, uh, I, I share with you uh, about my experience with YC Lee, I, I, I would like to introduce about my background a little bit. Yes, uh, previously Jason uh, mentioned me, uh, yeah, I'm the uh, specialist uh, regarding with the flood uh, management center. Uh, so are uh, you might uh, wonder that I work with the data. Yeah, uh, so um, in a in tower country like Myanmar have a lot of uh, challenges uh, regarding with the, uh, working with the, with the data. So uh, yeah, the, that's the challenges, but uh, we are, uh, Oh, we always arguing with the about the data and that yeah I'm uh, I'm overcoming about that data uh, requirement and uh, I'm really committed to the environmental education as well. Uh, so uh, currently I'm working for the research related with environmental rights. Uh, so uh, that that's about uh, my background a little bit and I would like to share about the. Uh, a learning, learning experience through my silly journey. Uh, like um, I have learned about that uh, from uh, academic fellowship uh, participation. I learned about nature is changing as we are changing. Uh, because uh, 
And then our suffering is the reflection of our actions. I, I say so because uh, uh, the natural changes, changing process is the slow process, uh, but uh, uh, because of our unsustainable development patterns and also over consuming patterns, uh, we are, uh, our arts are paying back to us. Uh, I'm, and, and then, uh, uh, so uh, like in Myanmar, I ha we have a lot of, uh, we are abandoned with the natural resources, but we are uh, lacking with the uh, sound, uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, environmental policies and uh, law, I mean, the, the updated environmental laws and policy. So uh, those are, because of those the problems that we are, uh, Suffering. Uh, I mean, uh, our environment. Uh, we we cannot uh, develop our uh, sustainable environment. So uh, in this way, I'm uh, my environmental concern is that uh, we have to uh, uh, we have to uh, make a quality action. Like uh, everyone has the power to change the uh, to change our environmental pattern. Like we, uh, I would like to denote the humankind that. We are the environmental doubters. We have uh, uh, we have the power, and then uh, if we cover it uh, with our own actions together, and we can cure the environmental problems. And uh, last but not least, uh, that this uh, Wesley program is the um, how to say uh, given the chance, uh, given the chance, uh, giving chance of the you to participate uh, in the. Uh, environmental uh, and in the sustainability development uh, system and uh, give the uh, mm, making the use to contribute with what they consent. Uh, so uh, it's the highlight of the YCLE program and I'm sure if we make a room for our uh, uh, leaders at, uh, and welcome our uh, their created actions, then we can uh, move to a better future and then we can create our own green futures. Thank you, Lynn. So, uh, Nin, I know that you've worked a lot on the impact of floods. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, uh, I think we've all seen more and more extreme climate events that take place. Certainly yes. in the United States, there have been many heavier rainfalls, more floods, rivers overflowing their banks. Uh, do you think, in fact, flooding has increased, and you've emphasized in your comments how everybody has to engage. Uh, and so what are some of the ways people can engage? Well, uh, every, uh, um, um, we individually, uh, uh, we, we, are, we have the different power. I mean that uh, we just need to show our respect and love to the nature that, uh, because our sufferings are the reflection of our actions. Like uh, flooding happened because uh, uh, because of our uh, like uh, forest de uh, forest uh, de deforestation and forest degeneration. That's the general concerns of, uh, of the flooding. Uh, but uh, so uh, by uh, following to the uh, impact of that, uh, uh, I mean the sources of the flooding, uh, we can see that the deforestation. Who make uh, the deforestation like that? Uh, so. Uh, that, that is not the individual problem. That is everyone's uh, problem. So, in, not to begin the deforestation, we have to uh, uh, we have to know uh, what kind of action uh, what kind of action do we need to conserve the uh, trees and forests. Uh, I I mean like the not only the forest like the biodiversity in our environment. What kind of action do we uh, sh uh, we should uh, take? Uh, we should uh, conduct to save uh, to save our environment. I mean, like just our surrounding, not uh, not not seeing the white nature. Just our see our surrounding and do what you can do because the flooding will be happening. Like climate change is stay going on, and then yeah, but they start with uh, what you can do and. Uh, like uh, that action, every action has the reaction. So that, that's what I, that, that's what I see. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nin. Keep going. Yeah. Great thank job. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nin. And if our deputy. Yes. yes. 
And if our deputy secretary will indulge us, I'd like to take one question from the studio audience. Grazia, could you please? Thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Gracia. I'm the SUSI alumni study of United States Institute in 2010 at the University of Montana. And to be honest, I'm so thrilled to see you in person because back in 2014, I still remember John Kerry was the Secretary of United States, uh, the Secretary of State sitting here at, the, at America and speaking about how the US leadership's dealing with the climate change and then we're now having Biden's presidency, invited John Kerry again, even as the special envoy for climate change, and you are even giving more detailed explanations on the commitments of the United States. My question is, how, how will the US presidents and all the team members ensure that this commitment back into the Paris Agreement can be even stronger than before or even beyond the Paris climate deal or Paris agreements because we are aware that the deadline is less than a decade and you also mentioned about the double funding or double the mechanism of the budget for developing countries and my second question is maybe very related to the how can the responsibilities in ASEAN can be equally treated by the United States government? Because we are also having the principle of uh, common but differentiated responsibilities under the United Nations. But I think we need to transform that concept into sharing responsibilities, as we are also having the SDGs, we also have the global partnership as the main component to make this deal happen and the agreement. I'm sure you're also having the same line or the same hope that we have sharing responsibility to make this climate uh, uh, climate deal or Paris agreements even better for the implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your question. I think you got part of the answer from our YCLE commentators today. All three spoke about how each one of us has to take responsibility that this isn't just about government leadership. This isn't about NGO leadership. Uh, this isn't about business leadership alone. This is about individual commitment uh, to getting to the uh, net zero emissions that we all are striving for. So yes, the United States is gonna double funding. The United States is going to support with technical assistance and, assist and other forms of assistance all the countries in the ASEAN community who are trying to move forward, many of which are already having to adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change. When I look up my mask and my breathing, you all of a sudden disappear, so that's why I'm holding my hand up uh, against the lights, because I want to be able to see you. So um, I think it is individual responsibility. It is things we have to press business to do, and we're seeing more and more businesses understand that the future is all of you, and all of you care about climate. And since you are all consumers and important consumers to corporations, they're beginning to respond to your demand that they think about what they're doing to help get to net zero. Um, and we also see all the advocacy from all of you as part of organizations, as individuals, and then ultimately, leaders respond to their citizens. And if their citizens demand change, uh, particularly in democratic systems where leaders are elected, uh, they have to respond to that change. So everything every individual does can make a difference as an individual, as part of a group, as part of a business, as part of a research project, as we've heard, as part of individual advocacy or as an environmental lawyer. Uh, there's so many ways, and if we don't all do all of those things, we cannot make net zero happen. So it really is on all of us to reach the objective that you have laid out. Thank you. Thank you for the question. We wish we had an hour and a half so we could keep you for a lot more questions, but unfortunately, <laughs> we're just about the end of the show. 
Would you like to make any last concluding comments for our audience and our in person and virtually and all of our Wysili members? I think I'd go back to what I said a little bit at the beginning. The future belongs to you all, to all of you who are here, to all of you who are with us virtually. We've heard from three leaders. It could have been any one of you sitting here or joining virtually who could have spoken about your own efforts. So I salute you all in what you're doing every single day. This has been a really, really tough couple of years because of the pandemic. And I have no doubt that in part we've seen this pandemic because of the change in the environment and what it means about the transmissibility of pathogens. Uh, I'm sorry that we are all sitting here in masks. Uh, I'm thrilled that we are actually sitting here, some of us, and some joining virtually. Uh, but we all have to do whatever we can to make sure that we will not be here again. And that future and that leadership is about you. I went to the Kennedy School to teach because I wanted to be with the young people who were going to make a difference for tomorrow. You are among those young people, and I thank you now, today, for what you are doing today and what you will do in the future to keep our planet safe and in existence, quite frankly. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here today. It always gives me energy on a long trip to be with young people uh, and see all that you are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you to our audience, both in studio and virtually. Thank you to all the Southeast Asians who are doing what you can to tackle climate change and make the environment more green. Thank you to our Waisili members for all the hard work you do. Thank you to our three Waisili participants for your presentations and dynamic answers to the questions. And thank you, of course, to our Deputy Secretary. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>